So We Rise Together is now about two years into a five-year initiative focused on community-driven economic development. Our work actually builds on the Chicago Community Trust's 10-year goal of closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap. And We Rise um, originated as an immediate follow-up to a $35 million COVID response fund run by the Chicago Community Trust. The twin COVID health and economic crises combined with the unrest following George Floyd's murder and made it clear that we were in a moment that demanded a strategy for an equitable economic recovery following COVID. Um, we know that the Black and Latinx communities were left behind following the Great Recession and allowing those communities to fall even further behind in the wake of the pandemic would cause an even greater divide in the racial and ethnic wealth gap. So post George Floyd, there was kind of widespread focus on the inequities and we knew we wanted to move quickly to take advantage of kind of this once in a generation focus and opportunity to build thriving neighborhoods in Chicago. We gave ourselves five years start to finish to underscore the urgency. And to be strategic, we focused uh, on three strategies that we believe um, will add up to the vision that you see here. Um, spurring neighborhood investments, strengthening local black and Latinx businesses, and increase, increasing quality employment. Most importantly, equity required that community had to be at the center. Communities already knew what they wanted. Many of them had quality of life plans, laying out their visions for what they saw as strong, a stronger future. And in many communities, we learned that there were real estate development projects that were already teed up, but that had been completely stalled by the pandemic. So we didn't really need to start from scratch trying to figure, trying to figure out what communities needed. They already knew. We needed to listen, to believe in, and to invest in their projects. Our model for um, strong local economies means that we honor the existing community plans and then in addition conduct conversations with community leaders who help to affirm that the strategies will in fact accelerate progress towards thriving local kind of hyper local economies. We also formed um, three pilot working groups supporting our grants recipients in three specific communities. And we, what we did here was create multi-sector working groups, so business, philanthropy, members of local government, to integrate our three strategies and bring new resources and really help those projects stay on track. Here is what we've um, achieved so far. In one year of grant making, it's going too fast, sorry. In one year of grant making, we've invested nearly $30 million to date including 23 million in 27 neighborhood anchor projects. Those projects are valued at a total of $291 million. But for We Rise investment and the flexible dollars that we brought to those projects, those projects likely would still, many of them would still be stalled. Four of the 27 projects that we have funded have already opened their doors with four more scheduled to open this year. These brick and mortar developments create anchors for broader economic growth. They also bring hope and some 3,000 direct jobs for their communities. With grants supporting small businesses and workforce development, another 5,000 residents will be trained by local workforce development organizations that we have funded. So how will we know this is working? Um, we're evaluating the initiative in an ongoing way with nearly real-time data, annual assessments, and a final report. We're focused on metrics that we think are meaningful to donors, partners, and communities. Things like how much additional money is spent and circulating near those anchor projects, how many jobs are created, and how many small businesses are operating. I think it's pretty exciting work. 
So I'm pleased to uh, be joined by three of the people who are doing the hard work behind those metrics to make our communities stronger. Gina Spitz is the Associate Research Professor at the Center for Urban Research and Learning at Loyola University. The team at Loyola is making sure we understand the impact of new investments on communities and we are engaging community members themselves in helping to acquire the data. Specifically, an organization called MAPCOR is an evaluation partner and they train and employ local youth as data scientists to collect information about community assets that everyone can use in Chicago to make the city stronger. I'm also pleased to be joined by Gian Foreman of Washington Park Development Group. Gian is leading the redevelopment of the Overton Center for Excellence, a former Chicago public school in Chicago's predominantly black neighborhood of Bronzeville. The, the site will house a creative hub that is accessible to the community and supports arts, technology, and nonprofit startups, as well as local businesses. And we'll talk with Juan Saldana of P3 Markets, who is leading the development of Esquina Cafe in Chicago's predominantly Latinx neighborhood of Little Village. Esquina will be a commercial and cultural amenity with approximately 13,000 square feet of commercial retail, including a business incubator, co-working office, local cafe, and shared community kitchen. So let's get into the discussion with our panelists. Um, and if you have questions, um, I think there is an app to record the questions as we go. Um, but if we don't get to your questions, we'll certainly try to follow up and make sure that we answer them. So I'm going to start with you, Juan. Mm -hmm. um, Esquina Cafe creates an important gathering space mm -hmm. and business center in a predominantly Latino community. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to learn a little more about the project itself, sure. how it was developed, and how community interactions have helped to shape the project. Thank you so much for a great question. So I'll start by talking a little bit about our firm. So P3 Markets is a commercial uh, real estate firm. We focus on creating mixed use, uh, scalable assets that uh, catalyze community reinvestment. And so Esquina is a phenomenal example of uh, creating opportunity infrastructure to revitalize a corridor. So the 26th Street corridor is a very active corridor. It's been a um, sort of a stalwart for the community, uh, the Latin community in, in Chicago, a lot of Mexican Families and immigrants have gone there and set up business for a long time. And for many years, it was looked at as the second magnificent mile. The magnificent mile, for people that don't know, there is basically the, the quarter with the most uh, retail taxes in the city of Chicago. Well, the quarter has experienced a lot of changes. And um, this particular building is, is right in the middle of the, of the quarter. It's a basically a three mile corridor. And so what we did is we started looking at it. So esquina really, we, it's a play on words, right? Esquina means corner. And so we use the word X to denote an intersection or a corner. And typically in, in a corner is uh, what we looked at as the old world where there was a lot of things that are shifting in the community and we wanted to create something new that would be transformative. And so in this regard, we wanted to create a project that really resembled what the community needed. Um, I, I had the opportunity to uh, interview many, many businesses and, and entrepreneurs that wanted to start up in Little Village. We worked with local organizations and looked at the quality of life plan to determine that there was a gap. There was a lot of gaps in the community. There's a lot of resources, but they weren't able to come together in one location. So we had to explain the project in, in, a, in a way where it makes sense, uh, where we're looking at balancing the economic development and making sure that the project is viable and can actually uh, become sustainable over the long term. So to create such a thing, we have to look at really uh, what are the uh, co-benefits that are created in the, in the process. And that took uh, you know, roughly about a year and a half, two years of really digging deep and listening to the community. So we assembled the community, understood what was needed, and then we moved over to the transaction space. And this is where we rise together was really helpful uh, because we were looking at a project that uh, was also drawing a lot of uh, interest from the community as, as well as the city of Chicago and other organizations that we're interested in joining us for this, uh, for this project. So the project itself is going to uh, create opportunities for entrepreneurs, but it's also going to pull together all the resources necessary so they can continue sort of building their stories. And the idea is Esquina being at a corner, being at the intersection of something old to something new, 
is really uh, there to create the new brand of entrepreneurs. So there's a legacy of entrepreneurship already in the community. We're just basically ex expanding on that going forward. So that's the gist of the idea. Um, and really the, uh, the value that we rise together uh, brought to the project was that it was stuck during the pandemic. And so the project itself, I think, will create a lot of co-benefits for the community. And it also is a sustainable project uh, on the capital side. So it's, it's made and built um, as a, a building and an asset, but also as an engine for community and economic redevelopment. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks, Juan. And I, and I think, you know, let's, Cam, let's follow up on Overton. Um, it's also a large scale project serving a largely black community. Um, and, and for those who don't know, Chicago experienced a number of school closings, many, many of them in our black neighborhoods, leaving some beautiful buildings completely unattended. So tell us about how you came to you know, focus on this project and how does the community feel about having this, it's a beautiful building, reopened? Yeah. Um, so in 2013, the city of Chicago, Chicago Public Schools closed 50 schools. As you can imagine, this was, it had a devastating effect on, on the communities themselves. These are the same communities that already were suffering from um, disinvestment, from population loss. Um, it's, it's the same thing happening around the country where you see uh, schools closing, churches closing, old fire stations, police stations. And so, you know, we thought that this would be a, a huge loss for the community. And even though we were going to buy it um, privately, we thought about what kind of use could we make where this could still be a great asset for the community. Um, so the, one of the first things we did was we put the building on the National Registry of Historic Places. It's a beautiful mid-century modern building. Um, that allowed us to utilize some of the traditional tools like historic tax credits, federal and state historic tax credits, and tax increment financing is available, and new market tax credits, the, the whole alphabet soup of, of development um, that, that we were able to utilize. And so this building had been, by the time we acquired it, the building had already been closed for three years, and, and so uh, it's almost a whole city block. There, there are two buildings. The main building is 65,000 square feet a second building that's uh, about 10,000 square feet. And the first thing we noticed was that it was dark. The building is all glass. So the first thing we did was simply just turn the lights on. <coughs> and we would do it in different patterns to kind of make it interesting. The second thing we did was we would allow neighbors from across the street to let their dog off the leash. Um, and that worked for a while until it didn't work, right? You can imagine. <laughs> and so, uh, but then we started doing other things, opening the gym and allowing, um, you know, people to have uh, birthday parties or a Zumba class or basketball. Um, people sit in the schoolyard and watch the Bears games, you know, bring a, a screen out and, and watch the games. Um, we partnered with a local planner, uh, uh, Lady Paula uh, from Borderless Studios, and so she started this series of events called Community Days, where each season, each year, there would be a different plan. It could be climate, could be arts, uh, could be food. Um, many of the things that the pandemic certainly exposed there was a need in the community but we already knew and so it was one of the ways that we were able to connect with community the people who actually lived in the community as well as people who wanted to serve the community so it was a way that we were able to 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 get a lot of feedback in terms of what was needed and what was wanted in the community you know the bronzeville community a hundred years ago when the great migration african americans came from the south this was one of the communities, one of the few communities where African Americans could live. As a result, there was a lot of brilliance that came out of these communities. A lot of the entrepreneurs uh, that, that Ebony and Jet Magazine or Johnson uh, Products, it was all, they all came out of this community. So when we thought about what the community needed and, and what would be helpful, this is how we kind of came to this idea of this kind of incubator office space. There's no office space anywhere in the community. You know, you'll see storefronts. And so we thought, how do we use this building to kind of be this launch pad uh, for, to serve some of the needs that are in the community? Well, thank you, Gian. And I, I'll just mention that a number of the projects that we funded have co-working office space because it is really not readily available and affordable in many of the communities. And it's, a, it's an asset that's, that's much needed. Um, Gina. Development impacts community members 
like from the moment the idea is proposed, mm. um, long after it's built, very often the big, you know, kind of uh, energy phase is when people realize that the dirt is turning and people right. are, are really starting the construction. But how have you and the Loyola team structured the overall evaluation to measure the impact of these projects as they as they open? And how do you know, how will we know how the community actually feels about the projects mm -hmm. before they open, after they've opened? Yeah. Tell us about the evaluation. So I think overall, um, being from Loyola, being from a community-engaged research and evaluation approach, we've really, I mean, I think you've heard in Juan's comments as well as Jan's comments as well that community engagement has been so central to how this whole thing has been built out the evaluation has been the same way. So what we've been trying to do is starting from the beginning, I mean, WRT really invested in evaluation for all five years, so we're able to take the temperature from the very beginning um, in, in multiple different ways. So there are some ways that we're, we're basing this on traditional metrics, I would say, but then, you know, of economic development that are widely used and, and uh, replicatable. But I think the strength, again, is um, and our ability to take the temperature in the moment right now to capture like how, how is it being felt in community by directly engaging with community members in the evaluation strategy. Um, so we're doing that in multiple ways. Um, but I think for when we're thinking about how things are, are looking at the beginning, we're really taking the temperature of what the initial impact is and how people are perceiving that with both metric, both ways that have to do with, you know, going directly to community members and, and seeing how they perceive things as well as using real-time data that we're getting from um, other places like spend data as well as um, travel sort of uh, geolocation data in terms of where people's foot traffic is really going. And will you compare that to like larger data sets? Like yes. Other? So, and then you know, in the longer term, over the la you know, we're in year one, um, and so you know, we expect to be able to use this, gather this baseline information, and see where people are at, where these communities are, and they're all at different places too. I mean, I think that's one important thing here. These communities, it's not. It's not a one size fits all. It's not that every community is at the same place. So it's really important to get baseline data from each invested community, right? And then in the future, um, you know, years three, years four, years five, we can measure against these larger secondary data metrics, you know, sort of traditional metrics of economic development. Again, but also bring back in that community piece. How are community members actually feeling the impact, how, because that's when you know, when they feel the impact, that's when you know that it's real. Yeah. Thank you. Gian, you, you've mentioned that kind of the scale over time. It's, it's a big project. What are you seeing in terms of other development? Are, is it spurring other people to think about that particular area in Bronzeville? Bronzeville is a pretty big geography, um, but, but when you have a project of that scale, does it attract other investors? Yeah, so the project is about an $18 million project, and we're not on an island, right? There are others who have ideas and other projects that have been in the works for a while, but attracting capital is always one of those tough ones. Juan has a project that he's working on. They just topped off uh, the other day. Uh, that's probably less than a mile away uh, from the site that we're working on. And, and so you know, in our community, we don't see other projects in the area as competing projects. We see them as um, collaborative projects, right? When, when someone comes to our site, we tell them, hey, go down the street, stop at this uh, shipping container. It's called Boxville. Stop over there, buy a cup of coffee. And we feel like the more investment that takes place in the community, first of all, just having comps. There are no comps in the area, so just the, the basic thing of trying to get financing, and there's no comps for office space because there's no office space. How do you get a comp if there is no comp? So in a lot of ways, our projects do feed off of each other and start one dollar attracts other dollars. Um, you know, one project starts to uh, help the other projects go. And so in a lot of ways, we communicate very well 
in what traditionally one might think that we would be competitors, but but we're not. We actually okay. work as collaborators. Yeah, well, why don't you follow up on that? What's, a, what's the it, other project beyond Esquina? Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's called 43 Green. Basically, it's a multi-phase project. That's about a $100 million project that's affordable housing mixed use. We had to convince light tech investors that a mixed use project in that neighborhood would really catalyze the community. And I want to touch on what Gian said. We, we're definitely very strong collaborators. We see this uh, sort of like creating synergies around where things are going. It's gravity, right? So that, that your project's pulling gravity in, and so all of a sudden there's gonna be a little bit more activity. We see the same way, and if we can communicate and really share some of the, the best practices, I think that works. I mean, for projects like the ones that we have, it's not like a banker has, you know, uh, neighborhood community uh, incubator on their vision board. That's not something that they traditionally invest in. So we need to figure out a way to really communicate the value beyond it being a capital value. There's also the outcomes and their multi-value outcomes that can be generated from this. So we again see this as a, a, a larger ecosystem where this is a synergistic pro project to ours in, in, that, in that neighborhood. In Esquina, that particular project on, uh, is gonna revitalize a quarter as people start to interact with each other in a cultural amenity, they start to understand more about what's needed. They share those resources and they talk. This is what's, be what's beautiful about your project. People are talking, they're engaging. And, and people underscore how important that is in community development, that civic engagement is so powerful. It also gives you the information that you need to be able to do your, mm -hmm. your deeper study. And so this assembly space that we're talking about, we're creating it right now. And WRT has really helped us do that. And we have to remember that no matter what, this is a transaction, right? All real estate is a transaction. So Dion's project, $18 million transaction. Esquina, $5 million transaction. The other project, $100 million transaction. So as we start building out the capital stack, there's a ton of information that needs to be there. And that's the thing that we're excited about is how do we build these templates, right? That we may be able to share with other communities that are experiencing the same thing. So all of these projects uh, are also, they leverage other projects, right? So I think about it as gravity and leverage. There's gonna be leverage for other like projects, and we're hoping that you know organizations like We Rise Together and the Community Trust see this, the value of creating these spaces is so viable to catalyzing community reinvestment and looking at all of the partnerships that we have and we've created over time. I think that's one of the other things that's really beautiful about this is that um, the co-creation process becomes so vital to all of this. And that's what, what's happening in our projects. We are, we're not only building them, but also co-creating them as they move forward. Yeah, yeah you know, I think I, just just to add on to that, you know, yeah. it's critical that we don't reinvent the wheel every exactly. time. Exactly. That these exactly. projects are scalable and transferable. That it works in one neighborhood, it works in another neighborhood, it works in my city, it works in your city. Otherwise, we keep starting from scratch every time. Correct. We're redeveloping a school. We went and visited five or six cities um, where they've already redeveloped schools. So we didn't start from scratch. We used the, the information that already existed, the data that already existed to say, hey, we're going to start not from zero, but we're going to start, start from, you know, 50% because we are, we'll take the data that these other cities have already gathered Absolutely. and start from that starting place. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that's so important because we're also trying to build on lessons learned. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a central building isn't enough. And we've seen this in Chicago where you have, you know, a, a Whole Foods go in, but nobody's created a strategy to build the small businesses around it to make sure that as you start to attract those small businesses that you're training people for, for the new jobs created. Um, Gina, you know, that's where your work comes in and is really important. Um, because we, we want to understand the impact of these large projects, but we also want to understand what happens to the small business community right. and how the residents are feeling and whether or not their economic 